Welcome to the e-textbook of echocardiography. In this module, we are going to discuss about one of the commonest cyanotic congenital heart disease, tetralogy of fallow. It is comprising of four components, a malaligned ventricular septal defect, right ventricular outflow tract obstruction at various levels, aortic override, and right ventricular hypertrophy. In an epical four chamber view, a malaligned conotrunkal ventricular septal defect is seen with aortic override of around 50%. The aorta is equally committed to the right and the left ventricle. On a color flow imaging from the same epical view, we can appreciate the bidirectional flows across the ventricular septal defect. On an anterior sweep from the same epical view, we can appreciate the narrowed infundibulum, the narrowed pulmonary valve. The aortic override can be easily be appreciated from the parasternal long axis view. We can appreciate a 50% aortic override. Also notice that there is a good aortomitral fibrous continuity. What we mean as aortomitral fibrous discontinuity is the close relationship between the posterior aortic annulus and the anterior mitral annulus which forms the aortomitral curtain. On a subsified short axis view, the aortic override is seen very clearly. On a parasternal short axis view, we can appreciate the large juxtatricuspid conotrunkal ventricular septal defect, the anterior malalignment of the coronal septum, severe infundibular stenosis and the doming pulmonary valve. The conotrunkal ventricular septal defect may be confined to the juxtatricuspid location in majority of the cases. However, if there is an extension anteriorly towards the pulmonary outflow tract, the coronal septum may be absent. In such cases, the VSD will be seen extending almost up to the pulmonary annulus. In this example, we can appreciate the pulmonary valvar narrowing, the pulmonary valve domes and the ventricular septal defect is extending almost up to the pulmonary valve. In the same way, there can be an inlet extension of the ventricular septal defect also. In patients who have trisomy 21 or Down syndrome, AV canal may be associated with tetralogy of fallow. This is a subsified short axis view of an AV canal who also has got an anterior malalignment of the coronal septum resulting in right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Apart from the large conotrunkal ventricular septal defect and right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, the other components of tetralogy of fallow is the aortic override along with dextrorotation of the aortic root. What we mean by a dextrorotation of the aortic root is a clockwise rotation that we appreciate on the parasternal short axis view. We can appreciate the right coronary artery origin and the left coronary artery origin shown by arrows. In contrary to a normal heart, this aortic root is rotated clockwise on this parasternal short axis view. This dextrorotation of the aortic root is frequently seen in many patients with tetralogy of fallow. Right ventricular hypertrophy is the sequel of systemic right ventricular pressures that is caused by the large conotrunkal ventricular septal defect in association with severe right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Hypersynotic spell or hypoxic spell is a characteristic dynamic hemodynamic situation peculiar to tetralogy of fallow. In this condition, there is a sudden reduction in the pulmonary blood flow from the baseline levels. This is caused by a sudden drop in the systemic vascular resistance that leads to shunt of the right ventricular blood into the iota. There will be a concomitant reduction in the anti-grade pulmonary blood flows. As the systemic blood flow is pumped directly into the iota with very little pulmonary venous return, the heart seems relatively underfilled on echocardiogram. In this parasternal long axis view, we can appreciate a large conotrunkal malaligned ventricular septal defect with an aortic override of around 40%. We can notice that the flows across the ventricular septal defect is bidirectional but predominantly left-right. 
However, when this patient goes into a hypersynotic attack, we can notice that the entire flow pattern across the ventricular septal defect reverses and the right ventricular blood is pumped directly into the iota. We can also appreciate that the heart is relatively smaller and looks underfilled. This is due to reduction in the pulmonary venous return to the heart. On a subsified short axis view, before the spill, we can appreciate the large malaligned conotuncal ventricular septal defect and bidirectional flow, but predominantly a left right shunt. We can notice that the entire flow pattern changes during a hypersynotic attack and there is also a very minimal pulmonary antigrade flow seen through the anterior deviation of the coronal septum. During a hypersynotic attack, in the parasternal short axis view, we can appreciate that the antigrade blood flows from the right ventricle towards the pulmonary artery are markedly reduced we are able to see only a small trickle of flows across the infant develop. This will be associated with loss of the systolic murmur which is commonly seen in patients with right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. After relief of the hypersynotic attack, we can notice that there is a good anti pulmonary blood flow through this right ventricular outflow tract. While most of the patients with tetralogy of fallow are associated with large non-restrictive ventricular septal defects, thereby making the right ventricular pressure equal to the aortic systolic pressure, in a small minority of the patients, the ventricular septal defect can be restrictive. This restrictive ventricular septal defect in the setting of tetralogy of fallow is described as the Hoffman's variant. The restriction of the ventricular septal defect can be caused by two reasons. It can be due to attachment of the septal tricuspid leaflet to the crest of the interventricular septum around the VSD margins or it can be due to hypertrophy of the muscle in the margins of the ventricular septal defect. In this subsified short axis view, we are able to appreciate a turbulent color flow into the iota from the right ventricle. In tetralogy which are associated with large non-restrictive ventricular septal defect, the right ventricular systolic pressure and aortic systolic pressure will be the same and there will not be any turbulence of blood flow from the right ventricle into the iota. However, in this example we can appreciate a turbulent color flow into the aortic root in spite of having the color scale Nyquist limits at 0.9 meter per second. On a subsified coronal view, we can appreciate the ventricular septal defect getting restricted by the tricuspid valve leaflet attachments around the VSD margins and the turbulent flow into the aortic root. On a parasternal long axis view, we can see the tricuspid valve leaflets entirely attached to the margins of the ventricular septal defect and because of higher right ventricular systolic pressure, the tricuspid valve tissue bows into the left ventricular outflow tract and in the subbiotic area. With a color Doppler interrogation, we can appreciate the turbulent flow from the right ventricle towards the aortic root. The turbulence is caused by restriction of the ventricular septal defect by the tricuspid valve tissue attachments. You can notice again that the Nyquist limits of the color scales have been set at 0.97 meter per second at a very high level and in spite of that we are able to appreciate a significant color flow turbulence in the aortic root. One of the reasons for restriction of ventricular septal defect in tetralogy of fallow is due to the attachment of the septal tricuspid leaflet to the margins of the ventricular septal defect. The another reason can be hypertrophy of the margins of the ventricular septal defect. Here in this patient, there is a significant hypertrophy of the margins of the ventricular septal defect due to muscular hypertrophy. On a color flow Doppler interrogation from this subsified coronal view, we are able to appreciate the right to left flow from the right ventricle towards the iota 
turbulence on a parasternal long axis view we can appreciate the relatively restrictive size of the ventricular septal defect in relation to the aortic root in many of these patients the amount of aortic override will be very minimal we can notice a turbulent flow from the right ventricle into the aorta the gradient recorded from right ventricle towards the aortic root in this patient is close to 2 meter per second the restriction of ventricular septal defect can be caused by two reasons one attachment of the tricuspid valve leaflet to the margins of the interventricular septum two hypertrophy of the ventricular muscle along the margins of the ventricular septal defect in a color flow interrogation from the subsified short axis view we can notice the turbulent color flow from the right ventricle towards the left ventricle outflow tract and the aortic root aortic override is very variable in patients with tetralogy of fallow in this example there is hardly any aortic override at all the parasternal long axis view of another patient who shows around 20 to 30 percent aortic override most of the patients with tetralogy of fallow will have close to about 50 percent aortic override a small majority a small minority of the patients may have more than 50 percent aortic override some of these patients may be defined as double outlet right ventricle based on the override criteria morphological way of differentiation between double outlet right ventricle and a tetralogy of fallow with more than 50 percent aortic override will be based on the presence or absence of subaortic conus if there is an aortomitral fibrous discontinuity it indicates presence of a subaortic conus and the patients can be grouped under double outlet right ventricle however if there is an aortomitral fibrous continuity and there is no subaortic conus then they can still be grouped under tetralogy of fallow right ventricular outflow tract obstruction is the primary pathology in patients with tetralogy of fallow RVOT obstruction in most of the patients is caused by anterior malalignment of the conal septum that results in narrowing of the infundibulum in this subsified short axis view we can notice the large malaligned ventricular septal defect the anterior deviation of the conal septum the conal septum seems to be protruding anteriorly towards the anterior wall of the right ventricular outflow tract thereby narrowing the entry into the infundibulum on color flow doppler interrogation we can notice the turbulence originating from this anteriorly malaligned conal septum on a subsified coronal view with the counterclockwise rotation of the probe we will be able to appreciate the right ventricular outflow tract narrowing starting from the region of infundibulum in this epical view we originally start seeing the four chambers of the heart but on a gradual anterior sweep we see the anterior deviation of the conal septum causing an infundibular narrowing we can also appreciate the malaligned ventricular septal defect the relationship of the great arteries is normal in tetralogy of fallow in comparison to the dilated aortic root the right ventricular outflow tract is anatomically smaller and there is a marked turbulence noted with severe infundibular pulmonary stenosis in some of the patients with tetralogy of fallow there will be a very low infundibular pulmonary stenosis with a good well formed distal infundibulum and the pulmonary annulus and main pulmonary artery will be of adequate size but in majority there will be severe diffuse infundibular muscular hypertrophy and a hypoplastic infundibulum when the infundibular narrowing is not extremely severe there will be a sufficient amount of pulmonary blood flows and the patient may not have any cyanosis this variant will be called as pink tetralogy of fallow 
The typical infundibular gradient by continuous wave Doppler will have a dagger-like shape with late peaking in systole. In most of the patients with tetralogy of fellow, there will be a combination of infundibular stenosis and valvar stenosis. We can notice the thick dysplastic pulmonary valve with doming along with infundibular stenosis. On a three-dimensional echocardiogram on the RV ANFAS view, after cropping off the anterior free wall of the right ventricle, we can appreciate a large conotruncal ventricular septal defect with aortic override. The margins of the ventricular septal defect can be seen immediately below the aortic annulus. We can also notice the narrowing of the infundibulum and the narrowing of the entire right ventricular outflow tract. Parasternal long axis view in this patient shows a ventricular septal defect. There is very minimal aortic override and there is severe low infundibular pulmonary stenosis. The bidirectional flow across the ventricular septal defect is the hallmark of tetralogy of fallow. On a parasternal short axis view, we can notice a very low infundibular pulmonary stenosis. The distal infundibulum is well formed. The pulmonary valve is doming and the main pulmonary artery is also minimally narrowed. Subsified coronal view with a counterclockwise rotation will also demonstrate the infundibular narrowing and the pulmonary annulus. It is not imperative that all the patients with tetralogy of fallow should have an infundibular narrowing. There will be a small minority of patients who have isolated valvar pulmonary stenosis. This is a patient with a good wide open infundibulum. However, the valve is doming and there is a large malaligned ventricular septal defect. Whenever there is isolated valvar pulmonary stenosis, usually the main pulmonary artery is well developed and there is a post genetic dilatation of the main pulmonary and left pulmonary arteries. But if there is a combination of infundibular and valvar pulmonary stenosis, there will not be a post genetic dilatation of the main pulmonary artery and left pulmonary artery. In patients with pulmonary valvar stenosis, if the valve is very dysplastic and associated with some degrees of pulmonary regurgitation, there will be marked dilatation of the main pulmonary artery, right and the left pulmonary arteries. The main pulmonary artery and branch pulmonary arteries are appreciated on a parasternal short axis view and they are well developed in this example. Pulmonary annulus is measured in systolic frame on parasternal short axis. Very rarely, tetralogy of fallow may be associated with very minimal narrowing at the infundibulum and valvar level, but with severe supravalvar narrowing. In this parasternal short axis view, we can appreciate there is a severe distal main pulmonary artery supravalvar narrowing. On a color flow interrogation on this parasternal short axis view, we can notice that the flows in the infundibulum and valve are very laminar. However, as the blood enters the distal main pulmonary artery, there is a marked turbulence. Some patients with supravalvar pulmonary stenosis will have an extension of the hypoplasia into the branch pulmonary arteries also. In this parasternal short axis view, we can appreciate the supravalvar main pulmonary artery, right and the left pulmonary artery, all of them uniformly of small size. When there is a diffuse narrowing of the pulmonary annulus, main pulmonary artery and the branch pulmonary artery, it is considered to be an unfavorable right ventricular outflow tract anatomy. The hypoplastic pulmonary arteries are a significant risk factors in the final outcome after tetralogy of fallow total correction. The extreme forms of tetralogy of fallow will have a very diffuse, severely hypoplastic right ventricular right outflow tract where there is a severe infundibular narrowing, small pulmonary annulus, valvar doming and the entire main pulmonary artery and the branch pulmonary arteries will be underdeveloped. Pulmonary hypoplasia is assessed by measuring the mediastinal and hilar pulmonary artery sizes. 
you can notice in this magnified parastinal short axis view hypoplastic right and left pulmonary artery the left pulmonary artery is more hypoplastic we can compare the sizes of the pulmonary artery with the anterior dilated aortic root left pulmonary artery is more hypoplastic than the right in many patients with tetralogy of fallow the origin of the left pulmonary artery gets stenosed due to extension of the tissues from the patent ductus arteriosus in the postnatal period as the ductus closes the ductal tissues that extend into the left pulmonary artery origin also goes into fibrosis and cicatrization resulting in left pulmonary artery origin narrowing another echocardiographic view for identifying hypoplastic pulmonary arteries will be from suprasternal view when we place the probe in suprasternal window on a coronal plane we will be able to appreciate the entire right pulmonary artery from its origin to its bifurcation behind the superior vena cava and ascending aorta when the pulmonary arteries are very well formed and of good size the outcome of tetralogy of fallow complete repair is very good the pulmonary artery assessment in tetralogy of fallow is done by calculating the McGoon index McGoon index refers to the ratio of sum of the hilar right pulmonary artery in millimeter and hilar left pulmonary artery in millimeter and dividing it to the denominator of abdominal aortic diameter at the level of diaphragm so McGoon index will be RPA diameter plus LPA diameter divided by abdominal aortic diameter at the level of diaphragm. If the McGoon index is close to 2, the pulmonary arteries are considered to be normal in size and the results of tetralogy of fallow total correction will be very good. If the McGoon index is less than 1, it means the pulmonary arteries are extremely hypoplastic and the results of tetralogy of fellow total correction will be suboptimal. The mediastinal pulmonary arteries are measured on the parasternal short axis view, midway between the origin and the hilar bifurcation. Right ventricular systolic function and tricuspid valve function will be normal in most of the patients with tetralogy of fellow in early childhood. However, as age advances, right ventricular systolic function and tricuspid valve function may deteriorate. This epical four chamber view shows a moderate tricuspid regurgitation in a patient with tetralogy of fallow, and we can also notice a marked right ventricular hypertrophy and trabeculations. On three dimensional echocardiogram, if we crop off the entire right ventricular anterior free wall we will be exposing the whole of the intraventricular septum from the RV septal surface we can appreciate a large conotruncal ventricular septal defect located immediately below the aortic annulus and there will be a marked aortic override the large conotruncal ventricular septal defect is shown in this movie by a double arrow we can also notice an anterior deviation of the conal septum which is tilted towards the right ventricular outflow tract. This causes an arrowing of the infant develop. We can appreciate the pulmonary valve and the main pulmonary artery distally. This three dimensional right ventricular unfast view is obtained from the subcostal window by keeping the probe in the coronal plane and giving it a marginal counterclockwise tilt we can appreciate the anterior deviation of the coronal septum shown by a small arrow the frozen frame shows the large malaligned subaortic ventricular septal defect and the anterior deviation of the coronal septum assessment of coronary artery origin is very significant 
in echocardiographic assessment of tetralogy of fallow. If there is a coronary artery that crosses the right ventricular outflow tract, it will complicate the repair of tetralogy by preventing a right ventricular outflow tract patch and a transhandler patch. In this example, in a parasternal short axis view, we can appreciate the right coronary artery arising from the anterior right facing sinus. The left anterior descending coronary artery is arising as a branch of the right coronary artery and we can see it crossing on the anterior wall of the right ventricular outflow tract. With the color flow imaging, we can appreciate the color flows into the left anterior descending coronary artery, thereby confirming that it is indeed the coronary artery. A frozen color flow image shows the flow in the left anterior descending coronary artery and this LED is arising from the right coronary artery. When there is a left anterior descending coronary artery origin from the right coronary artery, it will be crossing across the right ventricular outflow tract to enter the anterior interventricular group. If we need to demonstrate this parasternal short axis view with the coronary abnormality in a cartoon representation, we will notice that the left anterior descending coronary artery that arises from the right coronary artery will cross across the right ventricular infundibulum or pulmonary annulus anteriorly. On a parasternal short axis view, we can appreciate that this left anterior descending coronary artery that is crossing the right ventricular outflow tract is far below the level of the pulmonary valve and the pulmonary annulus. When we utilize color flow imaging, we can notice the infundibular narrowing and the color flow turbulence across the infundibulum and we can also see the left anterior descending coronary artery crossing the infundibulum much below the level of the pulmonary valve. On a parasternal modified long axis view which opens out the entire right ventricular outflow tract we can appreciate the pulmonary valve at the level of the pulmonary annulus and the plane at which the left anterior descending coronary artery crosses. The place where the LED crosses the right ventricular infundibulum is located much below the level of the annulus. When we incorporate the color flow imaging, we can notice the position of the left anterior descending coronary artery, the infundibular narrowing and the position of the pulmonary annulus. When we measure the distance between the pulmonary annulus and the location of the left anterior descending coronary artery, we notice that there is a 1 cm separation and in these patients, we will be able to easily accommodate a transhandler patch without disturbing the coronary artery that is crossing the right ventricular outflow tract. In contrary to the previous example where the right coronary artery was giving off the left anterior descending coronary artery, in this example of parasternal short axis view, we can appreciate a normal origin of the LCA and RCA from the aortic root. Note the dextro rotation of the aortic root. The right coronary artery arises from the anterior sinus and courses towards the right. The left coronary artery arises from the left sinus and branches off into left anterior descending and left circumflex artery. Sometimes the right coronary artery may give off small coronal branches as shown in this parasternal short axis view and these small blood vessels are not of major significance. Another coronary artery abnormality of significance in tetralogy of fallow is origin of the right coronary artery from the left coronary artery or LAD. In this parasternal short axis view, we will appreciate that the right coronary artery is not arising from the aortic root. Instead, we can see a horizontal echolucent right coronary artery coursing all the way anterior to the aortic root and the right ventricular outflow tract. The parallel echolucent structure that is seen anterior to the right ventricular outflow tract is the right coronary artery. On a cartoon example, 
the left coronary artery will be the single coronary artery. It will give off branches that include right coronary artery, left anterior descending and left circumflex artery. The right coronary artery will course anterior to the right ventricular outflow tract from left side to right side. If this patient needs a right ventricular outflow tract patch or a transhandler patch, the right coronary artery that is crossing the right ventricular outflow tract will prevent placement of a generous right ventricular outflow tract patch. On a color flow imaging, in a patient through parasternal short axis view, we can appreciate the entire course of the right coronary artery coming off from the left coronary artery. The flow in the right coronary artery is shown as a red color in the echolucent parallel tract that is seen anterior to the right ventricular outflow tract. On this parasternal short axis view, we can notice the parallel track of right coronary artery coursing much anterior to the right ventricular outflow tract and the aortic root and coursing from the left towards the right AV group. The parallel echolucent channel that is seen anteriorly is the right coronary artery. Aortic arch abnormalities are seen in about one-fourth of patients with tetralogy of fallow. Tetralogy of fallow is often associated with mutations on the 22q11 gene and these patients are likely to have higher incidence of arch anomalies. Right aortic arch is one of the commonest arch anomaly seen in patients with tetralogy of fallow. Identification of an arch to be on the right side will be by suprasternal coronal plane imaging where we find the aortic arch on the right side of the tracheal rings. The first branch from the right aortic arch will be coursing towards the left and it will bifurcate into two branches. This vessel will be the left innominate artery and the two branches will be the left carotid and left subclavian arteries. Sometimes the left innominate artery that arises from the right aortic arch may give off a vertical patent ductus arteriosus that will course inferiorly towards the branch pulmonary arteries. This vertical PDA from the left denominate artery will have an appearance that is similar to a BT shunt. We can notice the two arrows that show the flows in the left denominate artery and subsequently through the vertical PDA towards the branch pulmonary artery. Sometimes right aortic arch may be associated with aberrant left subclavian artery in patients with tetralogy of fallow. We can appreciate the aberrancy of origin of the left subclavian artery in patients with right aortic arch by noticing that the first arch branch does not bifurcate into two. If the first arch branch bifurcates into two, it represents the left innominate artery and the two branches are left carotid and left subclavian artery. If the first arch branch is non-bifurcating and courses towards the left side, it is the left carotid artery alone. And in such patients, on a posterior sweep, we will be able to appreciate an aberrant retroesophageal left subclavian artery. Ductus in tetralogy of fallow are known to be very tortuous and have a proximal origin in the aortic arch. In this example, from the suprasternal long axis view, we can notice an extreme tortuosity of the ductus arteriosus with continuous flow into the pulmonary arteries. We saw an example of a vertical PDA arising from the left denominate artery in the setting of right aortic arch. Subsequently, we saw a tortuous PDA in the setting of a left aortic arch arising from the undersurface of the arch. In this suprasternal coronal view, we notice a right aortic arch with left denominate artery as the first branch, which bifurcates into left carotid and left subclavian artery. 
left subclavian artery is very dilated because it gives off a large ductus arteriosus that courses down vertically towards the pulmonary artery bifurcation. When we do a color flow imaging, we can appreciate the right aortic arch, left denominate artery. There is an accelerated flow in the left denominate artery and left subclavian artery. Left subclavian artery is dilated due to the presence of this large ductus and there is an abnormal PDA that originates from the left subclavian artery, courses down vertically towards the pulmonary artery bifurcation. Presence of additional ventricular septal defects in muscular location is seen in about 10% of patients with tetralogy of fellow. In this epical four chamber view, we can appreciate multiple mid muscular small defects. On a subsified short axis view, the epical septum shows multiple oblique tortuous color jets indicating a Swiss cheese epical septum. This will be multiple epical muscular ventricular septal defects. Epical four chamber view of another patient showing a high muscular ventricular septal defect located in the inlet muscular septum. In this subsified short axis view, we can notice a large posterior muscular ventricular septal defect. The color flows across the large posterior muscular ventricular septal defect is shown on color Doppler in this subsified short axis view. Identification of all these muscular ventricular septal defects are extremely important before surgical correction. Ventricular function is often normal in younger patients with tetralogy of fallow. However, as age advances, ventricular dysfunction sets in and the systolic contractility becomes slow. In this adult patient, there is a marked biventricular dilatation, more so of the left ventricle. We can notice a hugely dilated aortic root and a resultant aortic regurgitation secondary to the root dilatation. On a parasternal long axis view, we can appreciate the aneurysmally dilated ascending aorta, the dilated aortic root, effaced aortic valve and dilated aortic annulus. The malalignment of the ventricular septal defect and the aortic override is very clearly seen. We can also notice that there is an aortomitral fibrous continuity and around 50% override of the aortic root. The aortic root and the ascending aorta are aneurysmally dilated. The aortic root measures 64 millimeter and the aortic annulus measures 43 millimeters. The marked aortic root dilatation can result in severe degrees of aortic regurgitation which will be one of the reasons for left ventricular systolic dysfunction in patients with tetralogy of fallow. The marked ventricular dilatation and ventricular dysfunction can be appreciated from the MO dimensions. Pulmonary atresia with large malaligned ventricular septal defect is an extension of the spectrum of tetralogy of fallow. In this parasternal short axis view, we can appreciate very hypoplastic right and the left pulmonary arteries. We can notice that there is a color flow from the left lung towards the mediastinal portions of the left pulmonary artery and subsequently the blood flows into the right pulmonary artery. This will indicate the presence of a large aortic collateral towards the left lung that feeds back into the central mediastinal pulmonary arteries. Identification of this color flow pattern will give a clue about the presence of large aortic collaterals to the left lung. In patients where the major aortopulmonary collaterals are too large, the central pulmonary arteries will often be hypoplastic. On the contrary, if there are no major aortopulmonary collaterals 
and ductus arteriosus is the source of flow to the pulmonary arteries the branch pulmonary arteries and the central pulmonary arteries will be well developed this is a subsified coronal view that shows a good sized right and left pulmonary artery with a mild confluence narrowing on a color flow imaging we can notice the flow from the ductus arteriosus in the region of confluence and swirling around of the color in both the pulmonary arteries in the absence of ductus arteriosus the central pulmonary arteries will be very hypoplastic we can notice on this parasternal short axis view extremely hypoplastic right and left pulmonary arteries whenever the pulmonary arteries are extremely hypoplastic we should carefully look for signs of very large aortopulmonary collaterals the mediastinal portion of left pulmonary artery in this parasternal short axis view measures only about 2.8 millimeters such severe hypoplasia of the central pulmonary arteries are seen in patients with pulmonary atresia who are mapca dependent from the subsified view in small infants we will be able to interrogate the whole of the distal aortic arch and the proximal thoracic aorta the distal arch and proximal descending thoracic aorta are the sites where we need to look for origin of major aortopulmonary collaterals A suprasternal long axis view of the aortic arch shows a vertical ductus that is arising from the middle of the transverse arch. Unlike the ductus arteriosus that is seen in otherwise structurally normal hearts, the ductus arteriosus in tetralogy of fallow and in tetralogy of fallow associated with pulmonary atresia will have a very proximal origin in the aortic arch. and will often be arising from the under surface of the transverse arch in very young infants from suprasternal echo window we will be able to see the entire aorta from ascending to arch to descending aorta we can also notice a large vertical ductus arising from the under surface of the transverse arch the courses of the ductus arteriosus in most of the patients with tetralogy of fallow will be very tortuous tetralogy of fallow with absent pulmonary valve is another variant in tetralogy of fallow in this condition there is a narrowing of the pulmonary annulus and there will be nubbins of dysplastic valve tissue attached in the region of the valve annulus there will be free pulmonary regurgitation on this pulmonary regurgitation causes dilatation of right ventricular infundibulum and dilatation of the main pulmonary artery pulmonary annulus is uniformly hypoplastic in all patients with tetralogy of fallow with absent pulmonary valve the branch pulmonary arteries are aneurysmally dilated we can appreciate the main pulmonary artery dilated to about 37 mm we can compare the size of the adjacent ascending aorta and the dilated main pulmonary artery the right and the left pulmonary arteries also measure more than 2 cm tetralogy with absent pulmonary valve is very often seen in patients with 22q11 deletion mutation on color flow doppler we can appreciate the stenotic and regurgitant jet from this annular region when we do a doppler interrogation we will notice a to and fro flow there is a pulmonary stenosis gradient of close to 89 mm of mercury and a free pulmonary regurgitation which fills the entire diastolic period on a subsified coronal sweep with a counterclockwise rotation 
will be able to appreciate the absent pulmonary valve, the dilated main and the right pulmonary arteries. On a subsequent short axis view, when we visualize the superior vena cava and its entry into the right atrium, posterior to the superior vena cava, we can appreciate a large pulsatile circular artery which represents the hilar portion of the right pulmonary artery. So the tetralogy with absent pulmonary valve can be appreciated from our very early interrogation from the subsequent echo window itself. Tetralogy of fallow can also be associated with anomalous origin of one or both pulmonary arteries from the ascending iota. When one of the main one of the branch pulmonary arteries is arising from the ascending iota, it is described as hemitruncus. This is an example of a patient who has a large subiotic malaligned ventricular septal defect, about 30% iotic override, and there is a large vessel that comes off from the posterior wall of the ascending iota immediately above the sinotubular junction. On a color flow interrogation, we are able to appreciate a torrential flow of blood from the ascending iota towards this posterior great artery. On a parasternal short axis view, we can notice the hugely dilated right pulmonary artery arising from the left and posterior wall of the ascending iota. The surgical management of tetralogy of fallow depends on the size of the branch pulmonary arteries. If the pulmonary arteries are not very well developed, then an initial iotopulmonary shunt is performed. However, if the pulmonary arteries are good and adequate in size, a total surgical correction is performed. Iotopulmonary shunts may be placed after sternotomy, as in this example. This is a parasternal short axis view, which shows a shunt that is originating from the anterior wall of the ascending iota and given off to the main pulmonary artery. This is also called as Roger Meese shunt. More often, BT shunts are placed through thoracotomy and this is an example of a left modified BT shunt that is given off from the left subclavian artery towards the left pulmonary artery seen on a suprasternal view. In this suprasternal view, we can appreciate a right modified BT shunt that is seen to course along the right side of the iotic arch. Sometimes, instead of a blaloptosic shunt or an iotopulmonary shunt, a ductal stent may be used to provide an alternative to the BT shunt. This is a suprasternal long axis view of the iotic arch showing the placement of a ductal stent. We can notice the continuous flows through the ductal stent in this patient who has been palliated with ductal stenting. In the same patient on a parasternal short axis view, we can notice the right and the left hilar pulmonary arteries and the ductal stent located in the region of the confluence. After we perform a total correction, in the postoperative echocardiogram, we should look for presence of residual ventricular septal defects, residu residual right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, pulmonary regurgitation and right ventricular dilatation, and branch pulmonary artery stenosis. Very tiny, hemodynamically insignificant residual ventricular septal defect along the margins of the VSD patch is quite common after tetralogy of fallow, and these are of no hemodynamic significance. However, in some patients there can be significantly large residual ventricular septal defects. We can appreciate a large color flow of blood from left ventricle to right ventricle through the superior edge of the VST patch in this subsequent short axis view. In patients who are surgically corrected using large transhandler patches. Dilatation of the right ventricular outflow tract and transhandler patch is quite common. 
In this example, we can appreciate the dilatation of the pulmonary annulus, which has been widened with a transhandler patch to about 31 millimeters. After a pulmonary valvotomy and transhandler patch, free pulmonary regurgitation is quite common after a tetralogy of fallow repairs. The significance of the pulmonary regurgitation is assessed by color Doppler interrogation of the distal pulmonary arteries. If there is a diastolic flow reversal in the distal pulmonary arteries, the pulmonary regurgitation is hemodynamically significant. This will often be associated with right ventricular dilatation as well. Right ventricular dilatation after tetralogy of fallow will be seen as paradoxical interventricular septal motion on M mode and by absolutely measuring the right ventricular cavity dimension on parasternal long axis view. Distal pulmonary artery narrowing is another complication after tetralogy of fallow repair. We can notice a distal main pulmonary artery tight stenosis in this patient after tetralogy of fallow repair. The distal PA narrowing can be associated with bifurcation narrowing of the origins of right and left pulmonary artery. In this example, we can see the right pulmonary artery origin measures only 4.3 millimeters and the left pulmonary artery origin is even more smaller. Stenosis at the origin of the left pulmonary artery due to extension of the ductal tissue and subsequent cicatrization and fibrosis is quite common in tetralogy of fallow. The left pulmonary artery origin narrowing will very often need an intervention for improving the blood supply to the left lung. The parasternal short axis view of a patient who had a severe bifurcation narrowing who was palliated with stints in both the origins of right and left pulmonary artery is shown in this parasternal short axis view. We can appreciate the free pulmonary regurgitation. However, there is no gradient across the pulmonary artery stented region. Suprasternal view is another echocardiographic view to see the location and extent of the pulmonary artery stents. In this patient, following bilateral PA stenting from suprasternal view, we can appreciate laminar flows through the stent indicating that there is no residual obstruction. 